I'm Walter Block. I'm Jody Emery. This is Adam Kokesh. I'm Jeffrey Tucker. I'm Ben Swan. I'm Tom Woods. I'm Peter Schiff. I'm Eric Voorhees. And you're listening to... And you're listening... And you're listening... You're listening... You're listening to... Ed and Ethan. Soak up the awesomeness. Listening to Ed and Ethan, the voice of liberty in Canada, coming to you from Saskatoon, the province of Saskatchewan, in Kanukistan. Yeah. My intrepid co host, Ed, joins me as he does every week except for last week. How's it going, Ed? <laughs> it's good. It's good. Yeah. I am uh, I am re- well rested. Well, not really. Well, yeah, you yeah. were out there I, portaging. I was in the bush. Yeah, going yeah. around and, and canoeing and portaging, and it was fun stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. We were, we were actually in the area of Saskatchewan that was the very first area that was. Um, Discovered by really? discovered in quote air quotes by Westerners. So yeah, ah, it's right, kind of cool. Right, kind of cool. Hey, look at all of these people living here. What are we going to call it? Not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I'm glad you had fun out there. I am, of course, your host Ethan. We are listening to us on DailyPaulRadio.com, as well as uh, Liberty Express, LRN, LMR, Freedom Phalanx, Voluntary Virtues, and so on and so forth. We're happy to be everywhere we are. Um, I guess uh, now that you're back from vacation. You're gonna be able to, you know, give us something of a you know, competent technical hand. Yeah, Ethan, uh, <laughs> I'm still not quite sure what all happened, but uh, yeah, no, we, I, we should be in safer hands, I guess. I, I think so. So we're more gonna, experienced, I yeah. guess. Yeah. So what you're telling me is that the interview with Tim Moen and the after show has not been eaten by the computer. No. this time. Yeah. Okay, it's so we're gonna there. have we're that. Good. Right. And we're going to have Tur Demeester back at some point. We honestly will. Yeah, we'll have to make up for that interview. And hopefully I'll be here for that. Because, man, yeah. I, I like listening to him. And I was He's really cool excited cookie. to listen to the show <laughs> when I knew that he was going to be on. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was less excited. <laughs> yeah. What? You weren't excited by me soloing? Uh. All right. Uh, <laughs> one of Turnemeister's favorite topics in the world, of course, is Bitcoin. And there is big news on the Bitcoin front. Newegg.com. Aren't they yes. Like, they're an online retail giant in respect yeah. to all of the little gadgets and gadgets they sell. And it's Computers. definitely right up that Bitcoin uh, enthusiast alley, too, right? Technology. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, what was it? Newegg, I remember years ago... Not years ago, months and months ago, the Bitcoin <laughs> frame of time is yeah. different than the rest <laughs> of the world. But uh, months and months ago, people were saying, Newegg is never going to accept Bitcoin. Mm. Uh, it's going to be too tedious for their lawyers, uh, for their accountants. It, it, it's a novel currency. The market is limited. The user base is limited. It says the currency is too volatile. People don't spend it because it's it's a deflationary currency. Mm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Take that. Well, not only is Newegg now accepting it, so take that, trolls. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, there is some sense of satisfaction there, isn't there? Now, we we don't have any numbers quite yet, hey? Like, uh, for no, what, not yet. They were, they, what they've pulled in so far? It's only been a couple days, I guess. Well, they started on the first of them. By the way, did I mention Tim Moen is the leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada? I didn't give any no. credentials or anything. Well, you, you, you did say that. I just I said think. he's going to be on the show. I think, right. I think you said the... No, no, you actually yeah. haven't yet. I'm Never in mind. fine form today. All right. Anyway, uh, so, uh, so, we, but no, Newegg is 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 a okay. So we've got these big retailers: Newegg, Overstock, Dish Network, some of the biggest names that have started accepting Bitcoin. Tiger Direct, Expedia. By the way, Expedia saying that Bitcoin sales oh. have incre- have exceeded their initial estimates. Cool. Uh, so that's pretty. Well, I know there are some wealthy Bitcoiners out there who travel mm, a lot. That's right. Um, yeah, yeah. To different conferences and such. But there's something that, that I've noticed about all of this, and, you know, it kind of appeals to me as an anarchist. Uh, so Newegg.com accepts Bitcoin. Newegg.ca does not. Hmm. Overstock.com accepts Bitcoin. O.co, the Canadian side, does not. Right? Yeah. So <sighs> Expedia.com... Why? Why? Accepts Bitcoin. Pretty sure Expedia.ca does not. Tiger Direct does. TigerDirect.ca. And it did take them a while to but implement yeah, exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. It did take them. Hmm. What on earth? This is more of these problems caused by imaginary lines, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. countries. And, and you don't just see this with Bitcoin. You see this with almost anything that any retailer wants to bring out. They got to more paperwork, filing more paperwork, <laughs> paying lo- more lawyers, essentially. That's and, right. 
uh, you know, different rules for different countries. So it's uh, kind of funny. You think of the trolls saying, oh, the lawyers and the accountants are going to have a terrible, <laughs> terrible time with this Bitcoin. Thing. It's not Bitcoin that they might have a problem yeah. with. It yeah. is the intergovernmental relationships that exist. Those are what create these problems. So now you've got Newegg and you've got their Newegg Canada, a different company, a uh, different setup. It's evolved its own way in, a, in, a, in its own sense, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Now, we haven't touched on this, but there's mm-hmm. some pretty big news that came out in Canada with regards to Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. Uh, eh? <laughs> what now? I, I know that it's like the one of the string, most strict strict rules when it comes to Bitcoin and businesses. Mm-hmm. Is that is that kind of what? my? Oh, you, you caught know? me off guard because I've oh. been meaning to read all about oh. this, but I haven't. I've only read like a tiny little bit, so maybe I, I, we shouldn't talk <laughs> about it. Because I was going to ask you, like, what does what type of impl- implication does this have for Newegg, and what they have to ju- do? They have to jump through more, even more hoops than they would normally to be a business, mm. a Bitcoin business in Canada. Right. Well, I mean, I from, my, so. from my very limited understanding of it so yeah. far, actually, no, you don't. There's not a whole no. lot of okay. different hoops to jump through. One of the one of the reasons that these companies that operate in different regions, you know, internationally, one of the reasons they run into problems is because they get like you start different corporate entities, right? Mm-hmm. So you've got you know ABC uh. Incorporated and then ABC Canada Incorporated. That's right. Yeah. So ABC Incorporated might make some managerial decisions about their business payment plan platform that uh, ABC Incorporated Canada doesn't, or, mm-hmm. you know, they, they choose different paths. It's all very slight, except when it comes to things like this that, ap- that apply to the back-end uh, workings of a business, then all of these complicated... You, basically, what should happen, really simply, is business grows, and then it runs into a border and goes, oh, that's a nice thing, and keeps going. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, because when you do run into that border, there are also a bunch of people that say, yes, it is a nice thing. By the way, you have to do things our way now if you want to cross the imaginary Mm -hmm. line. So it creates complications. Creating overhead, too. Like, you got to have another CEO, essentially. You know, he might be a shadow-ish type CEO, but he's got to be there. Yeah, it's usually a vice president that runs Ah. the show somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. Or Mm -hmm. it depends, right? Different corporate entities, yeah, it'll have a different CEO. And it's it's just really weird. (laughs) There's no reason for it to actually exist aside from the fact that countries impose these unfortunate requirements, these structural complexities upon a a free market enterprise. Mm -hmm. And now the internet, uh, hopefully, is, uh, you know... It's kind of uh, making borders, um, you still have to comply with them, but it's kind of making them obsolete in certain ways, too. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, Bitcoin does make those. Exactly. Those, yeah. I was exactly. just going to say, like in Africa, you can start up a business and p- provide your services with Bitcoin or accept Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. You don't have to comply with any, uh, well, <laughs> you, I, you kind of do and you kind of don't have to apply. It's to reducing rules. friction, doesn't yeah. get rid of it. Government yeah. is still there. It's just not, you know. Yeah. Um, but speaking of this international reach, uh, there is something else that I thought was kind of neat. And I don't normally source any information from the website that we've sourced it from, which is Stormcloud's <laughs> Gathering. But, uh, you know, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to talk uh, Aaron Hawkins down. I think uh, he's got some stuff that's pretty neat sometimes, and this is one of them. He's um, got, he definitely has a good way to produce. He produces pretty good videos. And, yeah. And, and he's got a fairly well understanding of uh, what's going on in the world, except when it comes to the economics from where our perspective is is coming from, I think. He, even then, he's, he's got a better head on his shoulders than some. And I, yeah. you know, like, he recognizes it's, it's, he's, the he's, problems, that's for sure. Right, and he's, he's, he spends a lot of time being studious in respect to uh, what's going on in the world. And, and, and this is where he looks at uh, currencies and, the, you know, the currency wars, right? Uh-huh. Uh, this is pretty neat. It's, it's neat because for people like us that just hate... I've got an American $20 bill in my wallet, and it's mm. kind of funny... I was given it. I was given it because somebody needed to pay me. So all they had to, to round out the payment was this twenty dollars American bill, and they said, "Is this okay?" And I said, "Yeah, sure." And I've almost like thought of it. Uh, I haven't exchanged it yeah, uh, yeah. for Canadian dollars or anything because I've, I'm almost like I've got this symbol of a collapsing <laughs> empire in my wallet. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. So I still got it there. I don't know. I'm not sure what I'm thinking about. But anyway, um, I definitely I have some American cash, and I'm definitely going to keep them uh, just for the 
you know, a novelty piece in 50 years or something. But in hey, 50, see, the thing that paper. doesn't make sense about that, though, is that in 50 years, you'll probably be able to pick one of these up for a penny. <laughs> yeah. <right? Yeah. laughs> so, but anyway, um, yeah, so my little foibles aside, uh, the rest of the world is also looking at American dollars more and more as kind of a, a token, a, a symbol, mm. <laughs> nothing more than a symbol of a collapsing empire. Uh, Russia, China, uh, brick countries, actually. Yeah. Uh, they are starting to negotiate these intergovernmental trade agreements that exclude the U.S. dollar, basically saying we'll trade in our own currencies. Yes, because right now you have to, with you, oil, you have to use U.S. dollars to buy and sell oil. Mm -hmm. So that causes some headaches because countries got to exchange their dollars for U.S. dollars. And then that, of course, creates a demand for U.S. dollars. So, and like, what is the, Why is that? Is it just because OPEC just accepts only U.S. dollars? Is that why the oil is always traded like that? Or is that because something to do with Bretton Woods? Uh, I don't think it was they... Bretton Woods. No, uh, I can't remember. But what what's, what has been established certainly is that there's this system looking for a uh, medium of exchange. Mm -hmm. Use stable. the U.S. dollar. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, stable. You know. Anyway, the hmm. U.S. dollar was was chosen to be that medium of exchange. There's a great deal of history behind why that was, and I can't get into that because mm -hmm. I don't know about it. Mm -hmm. But but there's it's cre this is largely what's propped up the American dollar is yes. being the world's petrodollar. Yeah, right? it's being backed essentially by oil, kind of. Yeah, in a sense. Yeah, and so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, it's it's so so. What happens now is that while the Americans continue to abuse their currency and mismanage it, mm. while in, initially all of that abuse and mismanagement is given even more of a pass than it normally would be given because every fiat currency gets a pass for a while that's right? right that's it, right it, it, it's just part of how it works you got to find you got to wait until that economic collapse happens but it does um, but it gets more of a pass because it is used as the medium of exchange for the for the global petrodollar economy in fact what's so amazing about this is that what we're looking at is a demonstration of how even when a currency is backed by the most active, integral, and important market on the planet. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. tell me one country that's not dependent on oil, right? All of us are. You get you take the biggest market on in the on the planet, or at least one of them. I don't know. Is oil the biggest? Must be one. I think of them. it is. I think it is. I think the second thing is like coffee or something. Too. Sure. Tie a fiat currency into that, it still fails. Mm. Like it still goes down in flames. Yeah, We're watching yeah. it happen now. Yes, Isn't that crazy? Like it, <laughs> it's interesting how the U.S. they they use their their dollar dominance and they pay off other countries and and essentially buy influence. Like mm. what's happening in in Ukraine, where <laughs> Russia has a very strong uh, influence in Ukraine, and the U.S. just gives them a bunch of dollars. So the, the, the this is why Russia wants out because they don't want to help essentially destroy their dominance in uh, countries that they hold influence in. That's right from the U.S. dollar from that aspect. Sure. So even even in respect to uh, just just moving yourself away from that influence, there's some value there. But but I I think I think it's it's way more interesting to note that yes, the American dollar is collapsing and even being the petrodollar won't save it because other countries want to distance themselves from a, what is increasingly more and more mm -hmm. a dysfunctional monetary unit. Mm -hmm. So so now what we're looking at, yes, uh, the BRICs are basically saying, yeah, we're going to start doing things on our own. Um, and it's not surprising. But what's even cooler is a, what was this? Um, darn it. It was a, a company in, in Kuwait, I think, a finance firm. Oh. They suggest trading oil in Bitcoin. Oh, oh, that gets me <laughs> perked up. Isn't that neat? <laughs> uh, there have been a number of proposals in the past to trade oil and gas in another currency than the U.S. dollar for political as well as monetary reasons. Some OPEC member states not particularly friendly to the U.S. whenever there was a crisis of some sort have been making repeated noise about denominating their price for hydrocarbons in uh, a currency other than the U.S. currency but have never quite managed to agree on an alternative. So wouldn't this work out quite well? Yes, it would. I know Gaddafi there, he was promoting some type of African dollar that was backed by gold. Gold, yes. And then uh, mysteriously, uh, he got ousted. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. But it was because he was an evil man. And oh, yeah. yeah I, I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. 
And what is it? The uh, Iraq. It took a while. <laughs> Iraq was the same thing. They we were just starting to say sell oil in euros and not dollars. Um, mm. Iran doesn't do that. Or Iran does. I think Iran is the, one of the was one of the only loan countries that uh, said no. We're not going to sell our oil in U.S. dollars. And well, the U.S. Yeah. hasn't been able to uh, get that propaganda war quite started with them <laughs> yet. Well, well no, they, they have got the propaganda yeah, war. They just haven't acted the actual war. Yeah, it, it, it's been in an ebb and flow kind of state. But yeah, uh, this this would be really cool. And this is kind of one of the things that you look at in respect to the Bitcoin market, how it can completely make uh, traditional monetary units just, mm. you know, obsolete. They're not mm-hmm. useful anymore, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So now you've got this... This uh, I look at... It, it's funny, It's kind of funny. Uh, I look at um, things like LTB coin, because we just got a big schmuck of LTB coin. Is it uh, 86... No, I'm not no? going to say how much it was. No? Okay. It wasn't that, though. Um, <laughs> okay. But we, we got a big schmuck of LTB coin, and that was kind of cool. Um and what's interesting about this is how how the technology, the cryptocurrency technology, is being used to create uh, securities, right? So uh, mm-hmm. things that you can trade on open markets, and you don't mm-hmm. have to have you know some sort of exchange that's approved by a government. You can have all of this verified crypt- uh, cryptographically to be secure and to be functional. That's Mm -hmm. neat. So when you look at this kind of thing, like could there be a market for oil in in uh, in cryptocurrencies? I think yes, absolutely. Cryptocurrencies could certainly be used. And because what are you trading right now? The reason the American dollars used because you need a token, right? Yeah. You need a token to exchange value in an agreed upon format. So yeah, would Bitcoin work? Oh boy, you'd better believe it would. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be Bitcoin. It could be uh, some separate. Cryptocurrency that is designed specifically for oil, oil hmm. uh, transactions. Or well, that, that's why that I mentioned works. LTB coin, yeah, right? Yeah. So the LTB coin is it for Let's backs. Talk Bitcoin Network, right? It's back. LTB coin is essentially backed by the business that is Let's Talk Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah. So it could the, yeah could this be be an oil backed digital uh, security? Totally. Mm-hmm. It would work so well. Um, and now that we've got, I'm sure. You know, Bruce Fenton probably has his fingers. I was gonna in this say, too, right? I was gonna mention. Yeah, we should ask him. I, I don't know because you know it's funny. I didn't even know who Bruce Fenton was until fairly recently yeah, when we started yeah. doing our Bitcoin stuff because yeah. he's been involved in Bitcoin, and now I'm I'm made to understand. Oh yeah, Bruce Fenton. Everybody knows who he is. Yeah, yeah. Stupid Ethan. <laughs> 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 I yeah. I just thought that was kind of anyway. Um, Let's touch on the Facebook thing for for a moment because I okay. I thought this was kind of cool. So you know that there Facebook has experimented on you, or well, you know some of you. Um, Facebook without your consent. Dun, dun, dun. Well, you know, kind of, kind of not. Because mm-hmm. um, Facebook had what was it with Cornell University? I think. I think um, so. Yes. Yeah, we can look in this article and it would tell us uh, University of California, San Francisco, yeah. Cornell. Yeah. Um, Second tier university. university. <laughs> <laughs> so uh well cornell isn't but university of california san francisco i think is i don't know are they uh, i thought i i just remember the office the people poking fun at cornell because uh they were oh. they were ivy league but they weren't because they oh, were like not oh, as good okay yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah i gotcha um so anyway facebook basically the the long and short of it they put these um you know uh, in some people's feeds, they put positive words, like posts with positive words in mm. it. They they put they displayed those more. For some other people, posts with negative words in it, they displayed those more. And for some, just kept their feed neutral. And so when the feed was neutral, people just didn't really post. When the feed was negative, people would post more negative things. And when the feed was positive, people would post more positive things. The implication being that, uh, you know, these... Uh, Feelings are kind of contagious, maybe. Yeah, right. I think Which, that's neat. I think that's. I think that's kind of cool. I don't know. I think it's kind of chicken and egg. Like I don't know. Um, uh. The conclusion might be the other way around. Like maybe yeah. they get it backwards. But anyway, uh, that's not really what I want to talk about. What I wanted to talk about was so. Okay, some people see this as horrifyingly creepy <laughs> that Facebook would because they did it without the impl- uh, implicit knowledge. I was going to say, why are you on Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> well, like, like lots of people are like, man, Facebook is creepy because you know all these different privacy uh-huh. concerns or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Don't be on Facebook if you think it's creepy. <laughs> this is well, a, yeah. Well, you know, that's kind of it. I'm, I'm, 
I'm just more remember. I don't know if I you you showed me this really cool because after your after your back from your oh, trip in BC, right. you yeah. showed me this cool video that Google just kind of puts together all on its yeah. own. Right, it takes your video and your pictures, adds music, and just makes this video, and it's completely automated. Yeah, right? it's so cool. I was it was a it was an old one that they took. They took they essentially I took a bunch of pictures and a bunch of videos on one day, and they combined music with that mm-hmm. and made it was like a minute long little a video of uh, of when I went in the helicopter over Smithers in BC. Yeah. And it was, it was really cool. I didn't pick the music. The music actually was decently, it was it fit the it's music and it kind of it fit what my, it's interesting. I have all my music on Google Music, so Google could essentially just, <laughs> you know, they could, they know me really <laughs> <Yeah>. well, <laughs> they, right? Ah, so, maybe that's coming next. Ah. But, it, but I mean, it's kind of neat, but a lot of people see this stuff as very creepy. And the reason... I think I said it here on the show before, right? The reason I find this really cool is because when you've got a a private entity that is trying to serve you, having more information about you is actually a really good thing. Uh I think of... Okay, say you're going to hire a butler, right? So you're you're a very wealthy person and you're going to hire... Give Jeeves. The bu- Jeeves? Sure. Jeeves? I think it's Jeeves. Jeeves? Is the, oh. Yeah. Uh. Jeeves. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> that's, that's the second hand butler. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You've what? ended up with a Jeeves. <laughs> what, what's the butler on Fresh Prince? What was his name? Oh, darn. Um, Ca- uh, n- no, not Carlton. That was no. the dancing maniac. Uh, yeah. No, no. Um, anyway. Okay. So you hi- you hire this butler and you want the butler to give you service. In fact, if the butler can anticipate your needs, like, Oh, sir, I've laid out your finest attire before the gala. I find this suitable for you. You know, like, if, if he's going to do that, that's great. That's a positive. Mm-hmm. Anticipating your needs before you even have them, right? Mm-hmm. That's the perfect butler. Yes. So what's different? When does the butler become horrible? Well, if somebody were to point a gun at the butler and say, you should shoot the guy who hired you, Mm -hmm. then suddenly all of the information the butler has about you is bad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) All of it can be Mm -hmm. used against you, right? Mm -hmm. So the problem in having these, you know, these private enterprise that can have your all of your information, I'm not threatened. By those people knowing too much about me. Mm -hmm. I am threatened by them being coerced by those who have an agenda and a monopoly on force uh, in manipulating those people to harm me. That's what I'm afraid of. And that is what is essentially happening from, you know, Google came out with like an ad thing saying, uh, you know, and I say, let us tell uh, (laughs) tell them what you're Mm -hmm. doing. Uh, We'll we'll tell them as long as you let them, let us to tell them. Yeah, that was convoluted <laughs> there. Essentially, it was we we'll tell you what's going on as long as they allow us to tell you, which oh, is kind of right. a cop out because like why don't you just tell them anyway? Well, we're breaking the law then, yeah. but they're breaking the law doing what they're doing, so it's like yeah, but then they have the lawmakers on their uh-huh, side. Uh-huh. See, it's it's all very. This is this is the thing. Monopolized force. That's where the problem comes in, right? Mm-hmm. He, there's there's nothing about there's nothing inherently. You know, I've I've also said privacy, outdated concept, right? Mm. You know, uh, what was it uh, you off air said to me something like, "Oh, you you go out into the street and people are concerned. They go out into the street and oh, cameras everywhere. There's they cameras can record everywhere. me. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, it's kind of consequence of going where there are people. You go out on the street. People will see and remember you. Oh! Mm-hmm. <laughs> or, or you're in your backyard and, and there can be a satellite image be taken. You know, true. You can get around that. Put a big tarp up over your house. You, you know? could. You could. Just there's, go. there's ways to, to do that <laughs> if, if you want to get that far. Oh, I was going to make a terrible joke. All right. We're going to be back after the music. <laughs> we're going to talk to Tim Moen. He's the leader of some party. The, the librarian party. <laughs> yeah. We're going to totally just hammer that joke. Aren't we? <laughs> All right. So uh, Tim Moen is on the other side of the break with us. You'll remember he's been on before. And boy, have I ever caught flack for that. Anyway, uh, we'll be back after the music right here on DailyPaulRadio.com or EdNethan.com if you're on our RSS feed. We'll be back in just a second. This is Ed Nathan. There. Attention, humans. I come to you from a desperate future, one in which all of the humans are dead. For many years, we have been running calculations to determine the most impactful point of failure that led to the demise of your species. It has been determined that too many of you were not listening to the Ed and Ethan podcast. 
Listen often, share with your friends, donate to the show, and visit edandethan.com. You have been warned. So, you love the Ed and Ethan podcast, but there's just one thing that could be better. I want some more. What? More? If you thought Oliver Twist had it rough in the orphanage, you haven't seen our PayPal account. Help us stave off starvation and bring you even more great content. Check out edneathan.com and hit the donate button. We also accept Bitcoins. Need the Bitcoin wallet address? One, two, D, U, U, Didn't catch that? Don't worry. It's on edneathan.com. Once again, we return. It's absolutely incredible. It's it's Ed and Ethan, right? That's, yeah, that it, makes it. We're one, not going into the breach. We're not. Yeah, the, I, no. I narrowly <laughs> avoided that. I'm glad you brought it up again. Thanks. All right. Anyway, I just have to say you got a cool <laughs> pin on today. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Davi Barker's uh, released some new pins at ShinyBadges.com, so I'm wearing my Rebel pin. What is the B? It's a Bitcoin logo. Of course, what Very should cool. we expect but anything but that? All right, anything uh, aside from Bitcoin? No, I, would, I I need some more Bitcoin shirts, too. Yeah, yeah. The, the Kill the Precedent. I guess that's not really a Bitcoin shirt. No, it's just a really <laughs> <laughs> Kill the Precedent. You have to be very clear yes. about what that actually yes. says. All right. Anyway, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the show, we're going to talk to Tim Moen today. We did talk to him before he set out on his campaign. Uh, he's become involved, I think, with some uh, national librarians group or something. He's become <laughs> the leader of them. I know he likes reading. Uh, we're going to ask him about that. He should be connected now. So, Mr. Tim Moen, leader of some group. You want to tell me what that's about? How are you doing today? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm doing fantastic. Uh, I'm heading into the breach together with you guys. <laughs> oh. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm leader of the federal, as my daughter's friend puts it, the federal librarian party. <laughs> uh, we love reading and we, uh, our, our, our platform is Free books for everyone, <laughs> as well as ponies and dental care. Ah, right. I'm I'm especially partial to the ponies. And we're we're strongly against Harper, who's put a muzzle on us librarians and said that we have no free speech. Uh, we're not allowed to comment uh, mm. on issues as librarians. So. Right. It's well, to that. well, as as Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper is, he's he's you know just not very friendly to those who like reading. I mean, most politicians aren't. Okay, look here's okay. So Tim, you are now leader of the Canadian Libertarian Party. The last time we talked to you, you were gearing up to be uh, the candidate, the Libertarian Party candidate for uh, Fort McMurray in Alberta, in Canada. And now we're so we had a disagreement, right? So I didn't like this idea. Idea because I thought, you know, anarchists especially, why on earth would you engage in, in, in uh, the political sort of exercise uh, when I think, look, we should just be trying to look outside of government and competing with government. So, you know, my perspective is what it was. And I think... <laughs> We, I caught a lot of flack for that. <laughs> you know, I got, I got, I got kind of a. I think I put the impression out there of having my kind of my nose up at everybody. I'm the real anarchist here. I'm telling everybody how it should be done. So it kind of had this Bill O'Reilly esque sort of flavor to it. Um, so I guess where I, what I wanted to ask you, uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. But I wanted to ask you for now. What has your experience been, you know, as a candidate, as having become leader of the Libertarian Party? I know that you've gotten a lot of press uh, over the last while. Do you feel like there's been real uh, earnest effect, like positive effect in your role that you've embraced now as a, you are a politician, right? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I'm not exactly sure what a politician is, uh, an actor on a stage playing a game. Uh, that's what I am. Yeah. I'm a I'm a guy standing up on stage communicating uh, a message. So I, I guess that's what a politician is. Sure. I mean, but 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 have you have you seen like the 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 like the results that you were after? What's your feeling from from that now? Yeah. No. I I have been very happy with the results. I mean, it's been a very tough process. It's one that I wouldn't want to go through uh, all the time. But, um, but, you know, there, there, there was an, a lot of people that heard about libertarianism that were exposed to the message for the first time uh, that had never, ever heard of, of liberty, really. Mm. And, 
and I reached a lot more people, you know, in the past few months than I ever have, you know, in, in all my time as a libertarian before that. So empirically, I'd say, uh, yeah, it was a great way to connect with people um, and, and get a message out there. Okay. Now, uh, if you haven't heard yet, uh, you, the election is over and you did not win. Yeah, um, Tim. I Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So, so yeah, I guess. But, but your goal was it really to create a notable splash when it comes when it came time to polling in a by election? What was what was your goal there? How do you reflect on the results of of uh, not winning a by election? Yeah. Well, my goal has never been to win an election per se or to get a certain number of votes. I mean, if that were my goal, I'd be promising people free shit and, and telling them that, uh, you know, their worst nightmares would come true if they didn't vote for me, mm. uh, like all the other politicians. Well, uh, but, but, you know, my goal has always been to, to communicate with people, to connect with people. I don't think that government exists. There's no such thing as government. Uh, government, if it exists, you know, there, there's a group of people that have a monopoly on force, and they're there because... Uh, because a demand exists for them. That demand is in the hearts and minds of people. So if there's government, it's in the hearts and minds of people. And the only way we're going to diminish government, get rid of government uh, in the long run is by, by you know, getting into the hearts and minds of people and changing their hearts and minds and uh, challenging their beliefs. Okay. So here's, here's one of my, my concerns is that perhaps you are seeing an illusion, a mirage. And, and it, what I've thought of when I, when I think of, and by the way, I need to make mention here too, ever since we've had uh, our most recent interview with Ben Swan, um, mm. uh, you really did hammer home a very important point. And that mm-hmm. is that, uh, that, that something that I not properly considered, that, that, that there are different flavors Yes. of communication you know we are all our special snowflake selves so you know uh, being a button pusher being somebody who exercises nonviolent communication there may be a role for all of these different sort of ideas i just want to mention that but where where i'm where i'm looking at at what you've done tim in respect to political action uh to to bring people a message of liberty um i guess do you think that uh, what you've experienced is kind of like, um, how do I relate this? Uh, say you go on MSNBC, dwindling audience, <laughs> it's a terrible, <laughs> terrible sort of place to go. But on, this, on the other hand, it is relevant to some people. You might get interactions from people that you never had before, but you are over speaking 60. to... <laughs> over <laughs> si- but you're speaking to a small audience. I, I guess it, my concern seems to be that, or it feels as though like, you may be going to places where their the messaging is becoming less and less relevant to people overall, and maybe it feels like you've gotten more interaction, but in fact, what you're doing is going to the diminishing marketplace to to try to express the most value. Does this make sense? Um, I th- think I hear what you're saying. You're you're saying that there's not as big an audience uh, in the political sphere. Is that what you're? More like you're you're going to the dwindling audience rather than trying to uh, go to the increasing audience. So you you are going to a place where uh, negative value expression is already being realized. People are already seeing it as less and less relevant. Um, so you you may be getting and maybe even that's good. I don't know. Like I I I guess I'm trying to figure out He's, where do you get the most yeah, value expression. I think Tim's hitting on places that don't get hit on. You know what I mean? Like you don't you don't see yeah. The I mean, I, you know, I'm politics. I'm going for low hanging fruit here. You know, people that just haven't heard the message that that it resonates with, and uh, and so and and that's working. I mean, it's it's empirically working. I I haven't had this reaction from other people before. I haven't had people read my blog, for example, and say I've never heard this before. This is brand new to me. You know, it's I'm usually either preaching to the choir or or sitting around in circle jerking and uh, not really reaching a new audience. And, and so, yeah, I, I do think that, uh, I, I don't think there's a diminishing uh, demand for this message. In fact, I think it's the exact opposite. I think that people are getting sick of the status quo and they're thirsty. They're hungry for something different and, and they're, the, the time is ripe to get the message out there. And so you have to go where people are going to hear the message. Right. And, People aren't going to liberty circles 
uh, you know, they're not going to chriscantwell.com to get their message. They're looking at political at a, at a political stage to get their message to look for something to you know. That's where they're looking to hear how can they how can we improve the world? How can we save the future? Right. And if we don't stand up there, if we're not up there, if our voice isn't up there, um, it kind of feels like you know we're we're missing a huge opportunity. And maybe even neglecting, you know, our our mission. Mm-hmm. Yeah, b- before oh, Ed breaks yeah. in, because I know he wants to say, I do have to remind you, Tim. And we talk to anarchists all the time. We have to remind anarchists all the time: no <laughs> swearing on the Ed and Ethan oh. show. Remember this: because you, you have to, there are community standards we're meeting. All right, ah, Ed, go yes. go ahead. <laughs> now, see, and I I totally agree. Like what what Ben was saying, uh, different angles. And different flavors and different. Wh- there's there's not one specific way to attract people to this movement. And people like for us, we are kind of going at like the minarchists who are close but not quite there. And you know they come listen to our show and they're like, man, I am a minarchist and I'm inconsistent and maybe I have to you know <laughs> well, yeah, be we more consistent. For, I guess. I don't yeah. know. Well, well, and and even consider this. I mean, uh, you know, in my own personal life, I went through the minarchist phase. Uh, you know, and, and I'm not even talking about politically, even though there was that, but I'm talking about with implementing uh, the, the ideas of liberty in my own personal mm-hmm. life with my family, with mm-hmm. my children. You know, when, once I finally got after, you know, a, a, a couple years of being a hypocritical libertarian who mm-hmm. practiced aggression against his kids and mm-hmm. used punishments against his kids... I finally got that, look, at the, the, the non-aggression principle isn't just a, a political idea. In fact, it's best understood as a way of relating personally to people um, that I need to apply it in my own life. And so when I applied that to my family life, you know, I be, kind of became a minarchist. Okay, dad's here only to use protective force. I'm going to, I'm the government in that sense, right? Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. And so every, my whole narrative came, became around this idea of, I can't use force against my kids. I don't want to use punishments against my kids. Uh, so I'm just going to step in and use protective force where necessary to protect them from danger. And and even that mindset didn't work, um, you know. But it was a step in the right direction. So there were still problems happening in the family. There was still, you know, troubling behavior coming from my kids, mostly because of stuff I had done to them and the way I was as a father prior to coming to this. Uh, information and understanding and so I had to find another gear after after minarchism called uh, entrepreneurial or or you know uh, I, I had to consider I had to be empathetic I had to get into their skin and try to see the world through their eyes mm-hmm. because I had to not just not use force and I had to get out of this mindset of you know that that I think we're kind of stuck in largely because all the argument I see in libertarian circles now is when do you use force? When is it okay to shoot a cop? Mm. When is it okay to use force here or there? Well, I, I think we kind of need to get beyond that now. It, it should be a given that we don't use force uh, to get our way in the world. But now the question is, how do we actually provide value to people? How do we serve them? Um, how do we, you know? And in this case, the question is, how do we how do we bring them this message of liberty? How do we get into their skin, into their uh, brains and and uh, connect with what's going on there and give them a message that gives them a sense of power rather than kind of rips the rug out from under them uh, because liberty can do that liberty can give people a real sense of power it's a starting point though it's not the end point mm-hmm. and then one one of the other things that that has been you know on my mind recently is that there there's no such thing as libertopia or statelessness uh, there, like there's no end point right there's no point at which we say okay our work here is done now we've achieved yeah. utopia uh, you know there's no such thing as a, like even if we reach what we would describe as a an anarcho capitalist society there's still going to be people like you guys and me on the fringes saying look guys you're <laughs> idiots you're, you, we could do better <laughs> we could do better than this uh, you know have you ever heard of nonviolent communication dum dums <laughs> <laughs> I'm not practicing it now, but uh, <laughs> or, you know, or or it could be something else. I mean, there's always going to be something better we can achieve. So you know, the, the, this idea that um, we have to go from government to this pure society in one fell swoop, 
I don't think is realistic. And I don't, I don't even think it's, uh, I don't even think it, I think it's a distraction to, to mm. imagine that, that we could do that. So, you know, I'm interested in moving the trend line in the right direction and the, the, the right direction is towards, uh, towards non-aggression and towards, you know, anarcho-capitalism and maybe something even further beyond that, like, uh, you know, finding that entrepreneurial gear or practicing nonviolent communication or something like that. But uh, people ha- ha- who are totally foreign to this type of language and to this idea um, need to be presented it in a way that they can understand it and hear it. And so that's, to me, what the political stage is doing. And I love talking in, in liberty circles and, and getting into, you know, <laughs> conversations about when is it okay to shoot a cop and stuff like that but but really to me that that's uh we need more people in liberty circles sure i think um this is and by the way if anybody's curious it's ed and ethan 100 watering the tree with tim moan when we had you on to talk about this um i guess here here's a and by the way moving the trend line, that's something I find a great deal of sympathy with. Uh, this is something I've been thinking about recently, too, is, is you know, what are we aiming for? And, and my answer consistently over the last uh, well, long while has always been that there is no real absolute. Um, I'm using the term a lot lately, special snowflake. And the reason for that is because it's part of understanding that we exist within a community of dynamic individuals, right? We are all different. We have all not only different needs, but different motivations, different perspectives. There Mm -hmm. is no uniform sort of that's how society's got to look in the future. It's more how do we get to where those individuals will uh, have a a kind of an understanding, a, a respect for one another to meet their individual needs and goals, to be free to pursue what they want and also be mindful of those around them. I think that's important. Um, when, when, we, when we come to uh, Ed and Ethan 100, I, <laughs> I, like I said, I want to make this about me a little bit because <laughs> uh, I received a lot of flack for this uh, and I continue to. And I think um, one of the things that we did was, and I, I've, I've kind of, I've dispensed with it today a little bit. Um, we went showmanshipy, right? Because we do that. It, it's a lot of fun to do that. Uh, in a sense, um, I'm not going to say I'm like Glenn Beck crying all the time, but you know, I want to, <laughs> I want to inject emotion and have fun. And I think that what we did is we came off as kind of Bill O'Reilly-esque, right? We, it was a very confrontational interview. We had an argument and it was a lot of fun, but uh, people, there are a lot of people that didn't like that. And I continue to get negative commentary about it. And I think, uh, for me, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to deal with because, you, Tim Moen, are somebody that I respect a great deal, uh, and I don't want to be in a position where I'm just dismissing your ideas. So when you were on last time, do you, <laughs> did you get anything out of that? Where What was your perception of what we did, the interview we had, and the discussion that took place there? Because I, I don't even know specifically... I, yeah, what was your perception of it? Well, you know, I thought the interview was was fair. I mean, I, I certainly harbored no ill will because of the interview. Um, you know, it did take the wind out of my sails quite a bit. Uh, really? And yeah, yeah, it, and probably you know, rightfully so. I mean, if if I don't have people uh, doing that, then then I might start to think that uh, you know, I'm a little something special. <laughs> and uh, that maybe I do, maybe I should just be ruler of the world here, just for a little bit, just to get us some <laughs> just, freedom, right? Know? Just to get things right for now. <laughs> yeah, Wait, just no, for now, <laughs> I'll just take the reins of power, and I promise I'll take off this ring and throw it in Mordor eventually. Oh yeah, uh, or Mount Doom or whatever. Yeah, no, I, I mean I thought it was a fair interview, but uh, you know now that uh, you know Ethan, I am right. Uh, I, I'll give you the chance to repent here. <laughs> Uh, from your evil ways and, and join the Libertarian Party and become a candidate. Oh. Will you commit to doing this now, Ethan? 
<laughs> I what? <laughs> uh, Tim, that's a very kind and noble thing of you to ask. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't think I'd want to be a candidate for any political party. Um, you know, it's interesting. Actually, I have thought of running as a political candidate. Um, it's a popularized idea in some libertarian yeah, circles under the name it. of nobody. Uh, mm, because mm. I'd love to run this campaign that says nobody will, uh, nobody will keep their promises. Nobody cares about you. Nobody will lower your taxes. Vote nobody. Because I think that's a real, uh, a great sort of campaign angle. But it's another method of communication, right? Your sure. your focus is something more detailed. Your focus is something more. Uh, I'm going to say. Mm, Book smart. You want you want you want people to become informed about the nuances of these ideas. Um, whereas I well, really no, just no, want to. No. I, I want people to be, just be exposed to the idea of liberty, just the idea okay. of non-aggression. Okay. I. So so I'm open to hearing ideas. I mean, if if putting my name down on a ballot as nobody uh, would connect more with people, I'd certainly consider that. Uh, you know, I'm I'm skeptical that that would connect more with people. I think. People want, you know, they wouldn't understand it and they would just be immediately dismissive of it. But sure. it might get a few people. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just trying to be cheeky. Uh, yeah. the, the, and and, and I, maybe I'm political biased. Theater, but, political theater, man. Well, yeah, yeah. that's what I'm yeah. looking at. When I look at politics, it really is, for me, it's political theater. If there is, it, to me, there's nothing serious there. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, well, of course, I, that, that's what it is to me, too. But, you know, the thing is, it's theater that people take seriously and if you mm. don't get into their skin if you don't if you're not you know if you don't have that entrepreneurial mindset of how are they going to best hear this message how are the people i'm trying to reach going to best hear it um i don't think you're going to connect with people tim, right tim on the campaign trail did you experience any uh uh people who had like this opinion of libertarianism and they like kind of were attacking you at all or or whatnot uh <laughs> during one of the debates Okay. Uh, after I tried to explain uh, in terms that wasn't horrifying to people our our idea of healthcare, uh, <laughs> I, I had the deputy mayor of Lac La Biche stand up to the mic and say, "I just want to say, you can take my universal healthcare and pry it from my cold <laughs> dead." Mike <laughs> and the crowd erupts in applause and cheers. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, uh, yeah, I felt a little, you know, I mean, look, this this was not an easy process. This was mm. uh, this was very difficult uh, standing up there. And, you know, people afterwards and even the, the deputy mayor, because I, I basically rebutted him fairly competently. But, you know, it, it's not an easy position to be in. You, you are you feel like you're alone in a horde of zombies mm -hmm. trying to munch your brains. But, you know, afterwards, people came up and said, you know, much respect. Yeah, I'm impressed with your answer and I'm going to have to look into libertarianism and, um, you know, you gave me food for thought and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, it's, not an easy, it's not an easy thing to do to stand up and try to communicate the message of liberty in enemy territory. And that's kind of what I feel like I was doing, you know. Mm -hmm. It, it is very tough when you're in a crowd and, and you're the lone guy and, and the mob is essentially rawr. <laughs> yeah. And, what? Uh, Do you, did you get any response in the few minutes that we have left here for this segment? Did you get any response from other candidates? I mean, because you were running against uh, the, the New Democratic Party, our, our you know, Canadian flavor socialists. Um, the Conservative Party are Canadian flavor socialists. I, you know, <laughs> so, but I mean, did you get any sort of input from the other candidates that was positive, receptive? Well, I mean, the candidates were all all had this kind of veneer of, oh, we're just all getting along. There was no negative political stuff, mm -hmm. right? So there was all this veneer of of getting along and being pals, and yeah, we're just engaging in this thing together and. So yeah, there was there's a lot of that. I mean, and and some of the other interesting things that happened were, you know, there was some rumblings from both sides of the political spectrum that they wished that I was their candidate, um, <laughs> because they saw their candidates as kind of weak next to me, and they they figured that hmm. if I was their candidate, they'd be guaranteed a win. Hmm. So this is the kind of slippery slope you do get into uh, in politics. Of okay. Maybe if I joined the Conservatives, I would be guaranteed a spot in Ottawa, and then I could vote my conscience and be, you know, like a strict Ron Paul and uh, mm. vote no to everything. And mm -hmm. and uh, 
and spread the message of liberty that way. And, uh, and so you can definitely see this kind of uh, slippery slope. So, the, you know, uh, I'm not totally convinced that, that uh, there, there's definitely dangers on this path, right? It's definitely not, uh, you know, absolutely right or absolutely wrong. It's just, like I say, a way of, of, of doing it. And there are perils to watch out for. I think. Did you have any any big businesses trying to uh, uh, bring you in to their fold, like give you a bunch of um, money and stuff like that, or was it mainly, mainly just <laughs> grassroots money? <laughs> no, no business would would touch me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you might actually force them to compete or something. You wouldn't want that. I mean, gosh. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, Tim, we're gonna we're gonna go into an after show here right away. I think I'm gonna ask you about uh, about. Um, something that I was unsatisfied of hearing you say on the independence on Fox News business. So we'll get into that. Uh, I'll get confrontational again. Well, you know, I don't know. It's confronting <laughs> you. Uh, but uh, to all of those listening right here on dailypaulradio.com, we do thank you for joining us. If you want to send us any feedback, feel free to do so. Feedback at edneathan.com. Check out the website edneathan.com for all of the latest stuff we've got. Um, you can tweet at us, Twitter, at Ed and Ethan, yes, right? That's yes, where we are. We're on FaceTubes, too, and all that good stuff. Uh, if you want to look back at the uh, episode with Tim Moen that we did have before, that's episode 100, Ed and Ethan, Watering the Tree with Tim Moen. There's a cheeky picture in, uh, in our <laughs> RSS feed on that one. I don't know if Tim caught that. But we'll be back right after the music with more from Tim Moen if you're on our RSS feed at uh, edandethan.com. Again, thanks for listening. This is Ed and Ethan. Ed and Ethan.